Testing one, two, three. <laughs> I think it's working, working, Mr. President. Thank you, Brother Mike, for that very kind introduction. And to President John, Dr. John Holstead, and to the members of the faculty, to all of the staff, I wish I could just call each of the names that have had such an impact in my life and have helped me to share this marvelous experience I'm sharing with you right now. Those groups who came to Memphis uh, last year and year before have made an impression on my life to the extent that we just have adopted them to be a part of the Memphis residency and also members of the Mount Vernon Baptist Church Westwood. We have to have them come back real soon and we'll honor them with all of the uh, amenities that we can possibly share with all of the kind things they've done. Let me thank the committee for selecting me for this special occasion to share with you today. I'm here because of the wonderful opportunity that God provided for me to share in the life of one of the greatest men who have ever lived, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. His life and legacy was all about freedom. He lived and died for freedom. And I had the privilege of sharing with him in that pursuit to the extent that it had made one of the greatest impressions in my life. In fact, though I was two years his senior chronologically, he was my mentor, my hero, and a man whom I loved. I had the privilege of meeting him and sharing this wonderful experience of freedom with him. My understanding of freedom goes a bit uh, further in the background of my life than before I met Dr. King. When I was six years old, down in a little one-house town that had only one traffic light in the center, called Alliceville, Alabama. My mother let me go and live with my grandmother, who lived on an 80-acre track little farm that was purchased by my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather, <coughs> who were slaves. I did not know my great-grandfather, who was a part of that uh, marriage and the owner of that land, but I had the privilege of living on that little spot of land that was purchased by my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather. His name was, we call him Papa Louis Ball, and her name was Louise Ball, affectionately known as Mama Lou, Papa Louis. When we moved to that place, my mother, my grandmother, great-grandmother, who was born in 1858, and had the privilege of marrying this gentleman, my great-grandfather, she would tell us a story almost weekly and daily, if, well, every time we went to the house. There were two houses on that little strip of land. And she would tell us a story of how slavery had affected their lives and what it meant to be free. She also told us how difficult it was to purchase 80 acres of land in Pickens County, Alabama, and pay for it after the, the slaves were free. And I heard that story over and over again, and though I never knew my great-grandfather, 
because she would not let him die. She told this story so well. I felt as if I knew him also. When I was able to go back home after her death in 1936, to live with my mother again, I had a privilege to move to Memphis. And there, I began <coughs> my trek of going to high school in the great Booker T. Washington High School, where President Obama spoke for the graduation services last year, and I had the privilege to greet him at that time. My experience in working with Dr. King began in 1963, after I was called to pastor the Mount Vernon Baptist Church Westwood. I was only there about uh, two years before he, Dr. King called for the march, the pilgrimage on Washington in 1963. My church raised an offering enough to buy my first plane ticket ever, and I flew to Washington and joined over 100,000 persons who had gathered from all over the nation and even the world to join this proud pilgrimage of Dr. Martin Luther King had called for 1963. I had, had a privilege to meet Jesse Jackson, who was head of Red Basket in Chicago, he was also a very close associate of Dr. King. And he was having to set up the stage. And because there were no chairs in the audience of 100,000 more people, I got close to the stage to help Jesse set the stage up. And because I got tired and decided to sit down on the back of the stage, that's where I sat. When the program started, I couldn't see King because I was sitting behind him on the floor of the stage. But well, little did I know that I was listening to, to at that time the great, greatest and most important speech of history. I have a dream. I was there listening to his voice, sitting behind him on the stage on the floor. I was not a stage person. I was just sitting on the floor. But that impact was so great in my life so when we got back to Memphis in 1964, we called a meeting of all of the ministers and others who would be with us to make some changes in Memphis. We knew about the, the great success that uh, King had had in Alabama and the integration of the buses. So we wanted to do something in Memphis. We said it is time now. We, we cannot just allow our college students to fight our battle. We've got to fight it ourselves. So we called a meeting of over a thousand persons to met at the Mount Olive Cathedral Church, Methodist Church there on Leonard and Lauderdale. On Sunday night, and we said we're going to ride every bus in the city of Memphis on tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. And we had over 500 ministers and other lay persons to make a pledge to meet at a local point and ride every bus in the city of Memphis for iteration. Monday morning at 9 o'clock, we gathered. But unfortunately, there were not 500 ministers. In fact, there were not five. There were only two ministers who gathered there with five other lay persons. One being the other minister was Reverend Billy Kyles, Samuel Billy Kyles, and myself. And a part of that other group of lay persons was the late Jesse Turner, who was then president of the only black bank in the city of Memphis, and several others. We decided to go on and ride the bus anyway. We divided up into two groups. And I rode with Jesse Turner and Brother Dotson. And we sat on the front seat in the bus. And the bus driver said, uh, uh, you boys are going to have to take the back seat and 
in the back. We said, uh, thank you, sir, but we're comfortable where we are. They didn't have cell phones in those days, so he had to drive a place until he saw a pay phone on the corner. He got out, made a call, got back on the bus. We drove on around across town near the old Sears building there in Memphis. And on across town on Cleveland Street, 15 squad cars were lined up, blocking the traffic to take four black persons off the bus. They took us off, slammed us up against the squad car, put handcuffs on us, threw us in the squad car, and drove off to jail with us. On the way to jail, Jesse Turner asked me, Pastor, would you offer a word of prayer? I said, sure. And I began to pray. And after I gave thanks to God for this privilege to make a change in the life that he'd given us in the city of Memphis and even the world, I said, the Lord have mercy on these policemen, for they know not what they do. They are being pawned to use to carry out the wishes and uh, orders of those who desire to keep uh, segregation and discrimination as a status quo. Policeman said, that's enough preacher. Uh, you don't cut that prayer off, and he had his hand on his nightstick. And I was praying with one eye open and one eye closed. And when I saw that nightstick, I said, amen, Lord, thank you. <laughs> we went on to jail. <laughs> The other group met us there, they were also arrested. And after about several hours we were processed in, there were lawyers of the late Benjamin Hooks, A.W. Willis, and, and Sugarman, who is still alive. Those three lawyers had gotten together to get us out of jail. And before night was over, we were out of jail. And we met again to decide on another meeting. We called it for two weeks, late, two, two weeks later. But before that two weeks was up, the city officials got us together and said, if you will call the city in off, we will see to it that the buses are integrated in the city of Memphis. And surely enough, in 14 days after we were arrested on the buses in the city of Memphis, as the first adults, black adults, to ever be arrested in the city of Memphis for integration. Buses were integrated in the city of Memphis. We moved on from that, and I was so impressed and so inspired by having 